No, but each show is different. So today we'll be featuring a little bit of Columbia City, but each show, which is part of the book actually. So, uh, but we've discovered that often audience members come with questions before the show begins. So Paul has taken to answering. These are not just questions about history. No, the bathroom is right <laughs> to that uh, entrance there, it's right to the right. And Paul will also offer life advice. <laughs> so at any point. So I'll just refer you to, to that hymn, see, because he, he's loaded with advice. He turned 80 last October, and, and on the day of his 80th birthday, which was October 28th, we launched this book. So that was, it was like a big birthday party celebration for Paul, and, uh, but since that time, he's just been chock full of advice for all and sundry. So if you have, at any point during the, sh during the program, if you would like to know about whether you should you know, stick with your current partner, or yeah. uh, you know, give up on the business, or start a new one. Paul has become uh, in his I'm ready. Eighty. He's uh, now our augur and uh, prophet. So. Sure, you must trust an eighty-year-old. I do. You do. Don't say. How old are you? <laughs> Sixty. Huh? Sixty-five. You're a kid. I know. What do you know? You got no judgment. <laughs> oh, that's where your, your wisdom you. comes from. Her. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll accept that. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, is anybody here older than I am? Let's see. I'm 80. Anybody? Back there. How old are you? <laughs> Both of you. Just shout it out. 82 next week. All right. Thank you. Bravo. 95. Oh. Okay, you win. <laughs> 88 over here. 88 over here. You know, that's double lucky in China. <laughs> All right, how many of you guys here in Columbia City knew Carrie Summers? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of you, okay. He was the guy who sort of introduced me to this group, and I came out and do quite a few lectures for this group you know, 25, 30 years ago when I could walk. All right. All right. Hi, Paul. I'm Karen O'Brien. I'm now um, uh, the president of the board for Rainier Valley Historical Society. We have all our board members are here, and I, I'm thrilled how many people came out because it's an honor to have you and Jean come out yeah. to Rainier Valley. It's been, I think, 21 years that you were here last. So, you know that? Yeah, we looked it up before we got here. That <laughs> our historian Nancy doesn't let anything go by. And wow. I said, when was Paul last here? Mm -hmm. So he was 59 when he was last here. <laughs> I was here with him, though. We did a show here. You did? Yeah, but that was, that was not for the Historical Society. We do a show for Town Hall uh, called The Rogue's Christmas. And we've done it for the last 12 years. So about a year ago, we did, our, we did a Town Hall show here. Great. Well, without um, taking up any more time, I wanted to introduce you to Clay Eels, and we'll get the show started. Well, we already know him. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Oh. Okay. Hello, my name is Clay, Clay Eels, and thank you, Rainier Valley Historical Society, for hosting this. Um, I have a, a great affinity with what this historical society do because, does, because what you do in the southeast part of the town, I've been up to my nose in for 35 years over in the southwest part of town, the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I've known Paul since, yeah, that goes back 35 years, known Gene, uh, the last dozen or more years. Uh, these guys are incredible historians, documenters of our time. Uh, need no introduction to those of us who still read the newspaper. and. Uh, I, it's been an honor for me to be associated with them in connection with the book that you're about to learn about. I was the editor of the book and I wrote the introduction for it and helped set up a lot of these events and uh, a lot of the ways that you found out about the book. So I just want you to save your loudest applause for right now for the people you're about to hear from in the next hour or so. Uh, Paul and Jean, give it up for them. I'm more tired, I'm exhausted. 
Okay, questions, anybody? <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Well, let's go forward. So we began, uh, we decided to begin our show uh, with, um, with a little biography of Paul. And as I say, it was first presented on his birthday, his 80th birthday. And uh, so let's just begin with a short bio of, of Mr. Dorpat. Wake me up, I'm so Okay, I'll, 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 I'll. Okay, so here we go. Sleep like a baby, you'll wake in two hours and cry. All right, so we begin with our little... Program for all Americans. Now here he is, Mr. List, as you like himself, Ralph Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the miracles of Photoshop. But those are Ralph Edwards' hands. You guys remember that show? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's Paul in the war years, and this is a shot that he's he's always told me that he and and his family always called Saving the World for Democracy. So it's Back yard in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Born in 38, we're guessing this is 42. Know. He's got the flag, and isn't this on the banks of the, of the river, of the North Platte? Of the Red River. The Red River. The flooding Red River, in fact, our property was often flooded. And soon after this picture was taken, his father, who was a Lutheran pastor, moved to Spokane, Washington. I'm sorry I didn't bring the slide to the bloody. <laughs> well, let's go back a little further, and here's Paul sitting on the laps of his, of his brothers. Did you know you were going to get this when you came to this Columbia City show? <laughs> no, you didn't know this. Well, here you are enduring it. <laughs> here's Brother Ted. And Here's the one Paul calls the handsome one. Well, that's self-evident, really. Well, I, you're pretty cute at this point. You lost it in yeah, a couple of years. <laughs> you, you were cute. Well, let's go forward now. We're going to do our first then and now with, we'll look at the four brothers from about 15 years ago. And the handsome one, here he is again. Yeah. And he has the glass of wine, which I think just befits his handsomeness. He is beautiful. None of these people survive except for one of them, and uh, I was the youngest. That's right, the baby of the family. Right, well that was already established, wasn't it? Yeah. Here's Paul with his dad, yeah. the Reverend Theodore, and his mom, Cherry, inset into the picture. Yeah. And I, I remember hearing from one of uh, his dad's Spokane parishioners when she heard Paul's voice on the radio. Her student was a student of mine. Her child was a student of mine, and, and she said, I, I, I just, it brought me back to my childhood. Their voices were identical. This kind of astonishing, yeah. marvelous basso profundo. I didn't know that, you know. I didn't know I had a voice like my dad's. Yeah. So we jump forward now to, from the war years. But I had more to say than he did, actually. He, he was a better rhetorician, but... But I really, he didn't have much to say. But he had a wonderful voice. Wonderful so voice. What, yeah. what he did say, he, he said. He was a nice guy, though. He was a nice guy. He didn't, didn't abuse anybody. He helped a lot of people. But he was theologically confused. <laughs> Go ahead. So we'll jump forward to the 60s. And this is the Helix. How many of you were familiar with the Helix? It was Seattle's underground museum. <laughs> A lot of people put their hands up, but they only put them up to about their shoulders. <laughs> I was sort of, what does that mean? No idea. How, so seriously, maybe only any five or six folks are. Well, Paul, tell us about the Helix. This was a this was the first underground paper in the Northwest. It was. Is that true, Clay? Well, at least in Seattle. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, that was what we called in in the sixties. In the early part of the 70s, it was the Underground Press Syndicate, and this had to do with the, what we called the counterculture, remember that? People that protested the war, largely, uh, while they were smoking marijuana. So that was what that was about, and, and one of the papers that Helix, I was the editor of that, is that right? I think so. Yeah, so that lasted a little over three years. 
great, a time of great excitement, great experiment, gr great friendships, you know, wonderful time. Well, I remember at the age of, because I was about 10 years old when the Helix was in its heyday, and mm -hmm. I remember uh, I would collect one of my uh, free or almost free copies and cut the back poster, which was often designed by Walt Crowley, out of the back pages and put it on my wall just to offend my mother. <laughs> I gotta talk to your mother, but I can't, unfortunately, I can't talk to her anymore. You'll have to say a prayer. Yeah. Well, here's one of Walt's designs. This is a poster for the uh, Sky River Rock Festival, which yeah. came out of the Helix. Paul was one of the producers of the of the festival, and you look at the names on this list from Santana to Richard Pryor, oh, John Fahey. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a kaleidoscope of, of uh, late 60s uh, stars. And they came out for this. And many of them came out, not all of them. A lot of them came out. Richard Pryor, wasn't he there? I was his, uh, his host. Really? No. So they all, I didn't know who he was, though. Nobody knew who he was. <laughs> but, boy, he was funny. You like Richard Pryor? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the festival lasted for three days. It was a Labor Day weekend uh, event. And, uh, and most of those days on the, in this festival, the Sky River was called, well, let's just take a look at it. Here's, first of all, before we, we go into the, into the thick of it, here's Paul standing in his famous saffron robe with, uh, with Tom Robbins. I don't think he can be famous to only wore it for three days. <laughs> And it was lost. Uh, someday we'll find it. Paul. Thank you very much. So he's standing with novelist Tom Robbins, who also came to the festival and was an old friend of Paul. You yeah. know, one time you told me that Tom wrote, uh, and maybe you were lying, but you told me that Tom wrote a portion of um, another roadside attraction on your couch. Like I never told you that. No, no, I never told you. I stayed with him. You stayed with him? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, in, uh, down in uh, one of those bays in lower Pacific. Uh, you know, one of those bays down there. Grace Harbor. It wasn't Grace Harbor. It's the next one south of that. Willapot. Willapot, right. He had a, he was living in Willapot Bay. So I went down there with him. <laughs> Well, during this festival, it rained for about three days, and there was a moment when the sun came out. But hence the name, I think it was called Mud River instead of Sky River. So the sun came out, and in our, in our various audiences, I've asked, did, did anyone go to Sky River? Do we have any Sky River attendees here? The second one. The second one, huh? Yeah. Okay. That was, you remember where it was? Huh? Washington? That was the third one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember where it was because I, I wasn't driving yet. So. <laughs> you went with your parents, did you? <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Family event, huh? <laughs> Good. Uh, and look at you, you survived it. Look at you. Stand up, Sean. Yeah, yeah. Stand up. All right. So we jump now to uh, the late 70s, early 80s, when Paul became our, our public historian. Well, this is, this is a book that he released, 294 Glimpses of Historic Seattle, just a few months before he started the Seattle Times column in the uh, beginning of 81. And here is uh, 294 Glimpses, and you sold them for a penny a glimpse. That's right, Gene, we did. Somebody how many copies did you sell? Well, over 40,000. That's impressive. That's how, many, that's how many of these we want to sell in order for us to ensure our old age. So we would suggest that you treat this book as an opportunity to give us a more you know, prolific and comfortable old age. These, these two guys right here and, yeah. our, and our families. And so uh, buy several copies. And well, which one? I, well, I'm just going to interrupt and make a little, uh, a, a bit of an announcement, which is that this book came very late because of our trade war with China. So we didn't get copies into the stores until December, early December. 
But in that three-week period, we sold 4,000 of the 5,000 copies that we had. And now we're down to around 500. So we have to stretch those through July until we get another 5,000. They're buying them up, haven't they? Yeah, they're going fast. <laughs> Think about your cousins in Peoria, Illinois. Wouldn't they like to see a nice picture of the hometown? And then that's what this book is. It's not simply a history book. We take his pictures. They're chosen to really show off the city, so. Okay, well, let's so finish. play is getting up, that means I'm going to change my subject. Let's, let's finish with your, we'll get into the book in about three minutes, but first we're going to look at you and Murray Morgan, whose oh, book yeah. Skid Road was just uh, reprinted. A new edition just came out. How many of you know Murray Morgan? You know who that is? Raise your hand if you know who Murray Morgan is. That's wonderful that there's a good portion of you know. So Skid Road, read that book by all means, okay. Uh, That's the favorite classic of Seattle history, Skid Row. Here's Paul with Lucy Campbell Coe. And Lucy, interviewed here sometime in the 80s, was uh, a witness to the Seattle fire in 1889 when she was three or four years old. Yeah. Yeah, she remembered it. Wonderful post. post this. She was... Uh, Children's Orthopedic Hospital, her family just sort of created that and nurtured it for years. And her husband was a, uh, a doctor there, and her, and her father was too, and his father was. So it was a really family associated with the children's orthopedic. So what would that be? Is that one degree of separation from the fire? If you I knew never, Lucy or the fire, that. or is it two I degrees? I never understood that, so. Clay, what is it? I'd say it's one degree. Okay. So we're only one degree from the Seattle fire. Here from burning he is up. <laughs> burning himself. <laughs> what I want to know is how many degrees history. am I from uh, having an opportunity to be on Johann Sebastian Bach's course? Um, that's at least another 10 years. <laughs> well, I figured it out how I could have my, my dad could have known somebody who was in the course. Um, he so had to be pretty old, but yeah, <clears throat> that's thrilling to me. So Paul and I uh, had been working together for, we, we put out a book called uh, Washington Then and Now, which we started in 2005 and printed in 2007. And we spent a couple years wandering around the state. By 2011, I think I'd been doing the photos for the column for four years. Mohai put up a show in their old space in Montlake, and uh, they just gave us free reign and said, fill the, fill the room up. So we filled it up with lots and lots of now and thens uh, from the city and across the state. And we opened it up with a foyer filled with now and thens from Paris. The first uh, a set shot by our friend Berenger Lamont, who's a Parisian photographer. And so here we are, and Berenger took this photo in 2011, standing at the, in front of the uh, doorway to the exhibit, or just adjacent to it. And standing with Berenger, now, this all came about because six years before, uh, Paul and I had visited Berenger in Paris. And so for our last little portion of the biography, I'm going to play you a, about a minute-long video of a, as Paul eats his chocolate. Which is, Anybody like a piece? <laughs> we're going to play a little, a short video of Paul uh, discovering an interesting character in Paris. So watch closely. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Oh, Paul, that's oh, that's he looks Paul. very much like me, doesn't he? He does. With right. the glasses, with the glasses. Take this video. Okay. Oh. 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 Guy who is, as it turns out, counseling a young woman. 
And now there's a moment when they both look up at the camera. And I start to laugh. I couldn't. Really <laughs> And that's Paul's doppelganger. <laughs> now, and that's never happened to me in, in my life. I've never seen someone that you, you would walk down the street and look at them and say, oh, hi. You know, you, but it was, it was eerie to, to walk on, in on someone and, and just walk past them and sitting in this cafe. What does that guy do now? He's been doing, I guess, for about as long as you've been a historian, he is a uh, Romanian Orthodox priest in Paris, and, and he actually, here he is about four years ago, standing in his newly restored church, which won several architectural prizes in central Paris. So, what, what should, I've forgotten his name. I never knew it, you know, I've heard it, but I didn't memorize it. Father Dimitri, Father I, Sergei, you know. I feel ashamed that I didn't learn it. All right, well, let's get straight into the, the meat of the matter here. All right, so, guys, uh, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our cover, uh, the, the picture on the right was actually the final picture we took for the book, which was the end of June, the beginning of July, um, last summer. And it, I had to wait that long because it, it was just days before that they took the scaffolding off the Space Needle after it's been covered for about a year of renovations. And if you flip inside, it's also the big gatefold that opens up to about four feet wide with the Times big spread in it. So this is just a tiny portion of it. Well, this is the very first column that Paul did in, uh, on January 17th. 1982, and it it was uh, this is the 63rd Coastal Artillery welcomed home in uh, uh, 1919, shortly after the war, Seattle Zone, and they had a huge parade and a festival and fireworks and bunting and festooned with flags. And one of the jobs that I think is that I've adopted as my own, particularly for this book was to go out and find its rough equivalent today. Now this is the corner, this is Westlake we're looking at. So this is the corner of 4th and Pike. And a couple years ago, uh, January 17th, uh, January 21st, uh, 2017, I found the Women's March passing by this same spot. How many of you were there? Gosh, that's a large percentage of it. That's impressive. Well, this particular event was uh, estimated to be the largest march in Seattle history with the, the hundreds of thousands who walked down the street. What, what were people attracted to that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can ask, their, here they are right now, you can ask some, why they, some of these folks why they were attracted to it. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so Paul uh, went out and took this photo in the fall in preparation for that first column. And here it is, looking at that same spot. And you see in the photo he captured a barista. This is before Starbucks went national. But here's the barista with her, with the photograph that Paul was retaking, standing on the corner. So there's a wonderful, sly little comment on, on Seattle history, right in there. Good. And here's how it appears in the first page of the book. What we've done is follow, choose 100 plus columns from Paul's more than 1,800 columns that he's done since 82. And those 100 plus columns are uh, in the same sequence, in the same order in which they were published over those 37 years. So you'll see the first column in the book is the very first column that appeared in the Times. The last column appeared last summer. It's just those two, the rest of them are jumbled. 
No, they're still mixed up. They're they're done in the same order. Honestly, the second one is second one is before the third one. Yep. It's <laughs> amazing. Why? We had to come up with an arbitrary. We thought should we categorize it by subject, by date? If you don't and, find the chronology of the picture itself, that can go all over. Right. So you just decided the publishing date. The public, the original publishing date. So you're as you're thumbing through, you're seeing the development of the column. You're seeing well. the development of my consciousness. I yes. Yeah. We're watching as your brain increases. And, you know. How about my ego? I don't know. I, I guess we're seeing that too right now. Gene, yeah. Gene, tell them th about how you reshot all the nows. Ooh, how did I do that, Clay? Well, why you did it. Oh. Well, oh, well, Clay, well doesn't, Clay never did like my photography. <laughs> So he was so happy to see Gene go out and reshoot him. Go ahead, Gene. Well, about, about three years ago, I started going through the 1800 columns. Actually, in four years ago, April of 2015, in planning for this, and uh, and the original the goal was to go back to choose a hundred or so columns and then go back and and reshoot them with modern photos. Because as you may be aware, a photo shot in Seattle, anytime beyond, in some cases, the last couple years, is a then photo. It's, it's changed a lot. And so some of these photos that are in the book, I, would, I kept going back and, you know, repeatedly to get the latest evocation. But uh, yes, I did, I did return and shoot all color pictures within, and most of them are, were shot within the last couple of years. So the Times, you may remember, came out with the color uh, Pacific Northwest Magazine, which is where our column appears, and so that was, a, a, he started doing everything in color, so we better do the rest of them in color, too. Mm -hmm. And how are we doing with getting them online? There, well, that's a, that's a good point. So if you go to pauldorpat.com, you will find every single one of the columns that are in the book listed in the same order. Uh, the original, uh, a PDF, a searchable PDF of Paul's original column, so you can look back and 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 follow. He's only talking words. about the ones in the book, though. That's all. At this point, the ones in the book, but we've also been scanning all 1,800 columns to look at uh, over because they don't exist anywhere else. There's no place. The Times site doesn't have them. The library doesn't have them. See, we've got a guy le losing here. We're losing a volunteer, Gene. <laughs> So sensitive. Yeah. Well, here we go. Well, right now, so this is a this is another very early column in the book, and it did come after the first column. And here is a, a record of uh, uh, probably in the days after, uh, maybe a week or two after Seattle's deepest snow in 1880, which began just after January 4th and lasted for the entire week. And the irony here was that Elisha P. Ferry, our state's governor, had, or, or territory's governor, had just said, uh, he delivered his State of the Territory address in which he proclaimed uh, Washington and uh, the Northwest as being a, a, a place with extraordinary clement and gentle weather. <laughs> and the day after his, uh, his speech appeared in the Intelligencer, it began to snow, and it snowed for eight days, for a total of 64 inches. So here we have, what's this place right here, Paul? Talk about our, this little no, structure. That's uh, Yesler's Pavilion or Hall of Harry's. That's at the southeast corner of First Avenue, which was called Front Street then, and, um, and, and, and then Edward Avenue, and then right here, what street is this, Gene? Well, we're looking at First and Cherry. That's right, yeah. Cherry Street. Wait till you see the now photo. Oh, What's this right? back here, Paul? What's this structure here? Oh, that's the Sheriff's Home, McGraw. And then up the hill is uh, the uh, First Baptist Church. Didn't that move up on top of Capitol Hill on Harvard? Oh, yes, in 1907 it went up to, uh, what is it, uh, right above Union Street. Okay up on the top of the hill, just above where First Hill sort of falls into Capitol Hill. 
Well, so we're, look, we're looking up first in Cherry now, and I'm going to, you know, I, I actually, whenever it snows in Seattle, and, and if you look at this week's column, you'll see one of my efforts to try to get out in the snow and repeat the snow shots that come our way. This week, this week is the snow on University Avenue. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I, I run out, I rush out, and I, you know, it's also a portrait of failure to some degree because there are times when I can get the snow and there are places I can get it, but first the cherry has always eluded me. I was down there this last snow, just as a matter of course. I think you did a heroic job, and I don't think you should put yourself down. Oh, let's see you. it. Let let's let's take a look. So, and I give you that caveat as you look at my modern shot. Aren't those snowflakes wonderful? Snowflakes, and I do call attention to the snow piled on top of that car. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's a deep in inches, yeah. Yeah, but it just began to melt. And the problem with first and cherry is once you're able to get down there, it's all, it's one of the first areas cleared. So yeah, <laughs> it's always troubled me. <laughs> now, well, are there any questions, you guys? Questions? Boy, they're a satisfied group. Mm -hmm. this, photog this photograph is taken by Anders Vilsa, who is uh, one of our great uh, photographers that visited Seattle for several years, uh, documented the, the, the railway uh, as it came into town, and, uh, and then moved into town and, and started taking pictures. His, uh, this one, his back is standing at to Pike, and uh, you know one of the uh, one of those examples of, of our changing city is incorporated here because we look at it today and here we are these are my students I teach uh, theater to elementary school and high school students and I take them down on occasion down to the market down to the waterfront and we discuss the changes right up behind is I was just down there yesterday taking pictures of the destruction and they, they're, the entire section of the viaduct from Lenora North is being, uh, has been torn down with a little standing portions of it, but it's going fast. So this actual, this shot is going to be um, uh, a then uh, within another couple months. That viaduct is, is going quickly. Mm -hmm. Down on the waterfront itself, looking north, another Andres Vilsa shot taken 98-99 uh, of the gold rush. Um, and I, I, I love this sign here, which I'll read aloud to you. It's portable aluminum houses, perfect for Alaska, weight 150 pounds. So I imagine in the Charlie Chaplin's The Gold Rush, that, that wonderful photo of all the miners climbing up the, the hillside, carrying the 150-pound aluminum hut on their back. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh boy, that's, that's something. And there we are today in front of Coleman Dock, same spot. Marion Street, oh, pedestrian yeah, 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 the subway. I've never eaten at that set, right? <laughs> well, Vilsa went back to uh, his native Norway uh, in, and spent the first 30 years in the 20th century taking pictures across Norway and became, uh, you know, really their uh, Edward Curtis, their Ansel Adams. I mean, he's, he was celebrated in 2015 in a series of stamps, and they document everything from village life to scenery. And he's really kind of, we were so fortunate to have him documenting Seattle in the 1890s. He was, because he was really good. Yeah. So our the quality of the photographs of uh, Seattle in the, in the 90s when he was here, and his wife allowed it, uh, were really good. Good stuff, really good stuff. Then they went back in, I think, 90 to visit the family, and then she had the news for him, we're not going back to Seattle. We're staying here. And as Gene just told you, the result was that he became a national treasure. 
in Norway with his photography. Well, we jump now to uh, the Smith Tower, and at this point, it's still under construction. This is taken from the 35th floor observation platform, not from the top. And it was taken by a photographer, Frank Noel, a Wallace and Stevens photographer in 1913. And for the first time from this location in town, you could see Lake Union, and you could see Queen Anne High School. And up here, there's St. James. And down here, there's the Rainier Club and the Methodist Dome behind it. So let's jump forward and pay attention, keep, keep your eyes on, on Lake Union, and, and then just kind of, if you can keep your right eye on Rainier Club, we'll just jump down and see what we see from the top today. So we'll be up, we'll jump from the 35th floor to the 42nd. So to speak. No, it's gone. But we still can see from the from the 42nd floor, we can still see the Rainier Club holding property. And up here, just a little glimpse of, of St. James. St. James Cathedral. Did you, did you hear that? Yeah, okay. How many of you are members of St. James? Any? Oh, you have a one. one. Okay. All right. Well, this is a a well-known picture of uh, the Monongahela, which escaped from Lake Union after three years idling there on March 25th, 1931. And it was towed over to Eagle Harbor, and eventually uh, its masts were taken down, and eventually it was sold to a Vancouver logging company, where it became a, just a barge and, uh, and disappeared. But the Monongahela was originally built in Glasgow, in 1882 and sailed the ocean blue for 30 years until steamships and, and, and other power uh, took over. Uh, as you can see, they pulled it out of Lake Union and the reason for it was because they were just about to span those final girders uh, of the, what we think of as the Aurora Bridge. So the Nagahila is being towed out and I went back to retake this photo and it, it's, you remember that snow photo with the little pile on the hydrant? Well, this is my version of that, because here's what stands in for the Monongahela. Yeah. Now, this is the uh, example I like to use for why you should purchase this book. Not only for yourself, but for your cousins in, in Louisville and uh, in uh, Peoria, Illinois, as an example of this picturesque, wonderful city where their relatives live. So you want to send that second copy of Martin third and fourth back to your relatives in those distant lands, which can't, or simply don't have a town that can just measure up to beautiful, beautiful Seattle. All right? Okay. All right, I'm sorry, I hope uh, I won't do that again. No, that was, that was wonderful. You know, it's like a, a portion of life as a historian and a huckster. Uh, I am a bit of a huckster, that's true. Well, let's jump up to the top. I'll live up to Clay's quality. He's the best huckster. Ever. He's a good one. Uh, he's, he's fantastic. We're about to climb to the top of the Aurora Bridge and look at the opening, but before we get there, I want to show you this key, which connects the Aurora Bridge to the Gold Rush because the fellow who created this key was George Carmack, who discovered gold in the Yukon. And out of his personal, and became a very wealthy man, and out of his personal um, uh, mines, he, he dug up these, uh, some of these, uh, these 21 nuggets on this telegraph key were all from his own claim. He mounted, and it's pure gold, he mounted it on Alaskan marble and he gave it as a gift to President Taft. And in 1909, Taft used it uh, to telegraph the opening of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. So that was the, that was the signal to set off the fireworks and, and open the show and cut the ribbon. Well, up above, now let's jump up to the top of the Aurora Bridge, which is also called, of course, formerly the George Washington Memorial Bridge. And this is February 22nd, 1932, the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth. 
and just before the the bridge opens, so let's let's imagine these crowds pull back from both ends, waiting to stream onto the bridge and celebrate its opening. Just before the bridge opened, uh, the uh, uh, the governor of the time, uh, Roland Hartley, who was deeply opposed to Highway 99 and this bridge and any sort of construction that would that would uh, that indicated tax dollars spent. He's from Everett. <laughs> was uh, taking full credit for the construction of the bridge. And uh, so there was a little bit of irony here, but he, he was going on and on and bloviating at such length that at 2.57 in the afternoon, imagine now Herbert Hoover with his finger, not knowing precisely what's going on, but he has his finger on the Taft key, Prime, primed. primed on the Taft key, waiting to punch it, and when the clock hits, Pacific time, 2.57, he hits the button. Down below, the fireboats send up their streamers. The flags unfurl. The, the, the crowds cheering break through the ribbons and come on to the interrupting Roland Hartley, who never got to finish his speech. <laughs> so the Taft key was also used several times throughout the country over the intervening years. The last time it was used, and here's our modern shot of the uh, of the bridge. Now, one one quick side note. Uh, occasionally, I just can't get up to the same height. So I secured for myself years ago uh, a 21 foot long extension pole. And in this case, the trees that cover the hillside um, of Queen Anne prevent me from shooting, from getting this shot. So uh, I'll put my camera up on top of this pole, extend it to its full height, and shoot with a little remote so I can, I can get something approaching the original. In any case, the Taft key was used for the last time by John F. Kennedy. And it's 1962, and he's opening the Seattle World's Fair of 62. Century 21. Oh, wait, wait, I have to look at my, if that's not Kennedy, that's Herbert Hoover. <laughs> So he's standing there now. Uh, this is, again, 2.57 in the afternoon. <laughs> I preempted that. That's Kennedy's like, double ganger. Yeah, Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> and here he is. And you can see the, the gold. It's in the Smithsonian. Yeah, it's a nice tan. Yeah, the yeah, hell of a tan. Yeah, he did. So with this press of the Taft key, that it was the um, Car Carmax uh, uh, Gold key was removed to the Smithsonian and, and where it sits today. And here's a little piece we did several years ago. Uh, one of the, the original photograph was taken in, I think, 2013, and we just didn't need to repeat it because it's kind of delightful all on its own. Here is Paula Dahl, uh, who in the final months of the fair arrived in, Oct I think, October of 62 with her family and was. Uh, they were waiting with, you know, streamers and whistles and, and a big purple dog and a nine millionth, she was the nine millionth visitor to the World's Fair. So it was made VIP for the day. And you can see her very, very happy parents who were also included and the lovely purple dog, lavender puppy, which she's lost, the nine millionth sign, and her very unhappy sister right behind <laughs> Here she is today, or in 2013, where she still has that nine million sign on the wall of her class, and she teaches elementary school in Issaquah. And she came out with her students to repeat this. One of the reasons why um, there are actually very few photographs of the fire, the Seattle fire in, in, of 89, is because so many photographers had their studios in that 30 block area where the fire, that the fire burned down. We imagine them, and in Paul's original column, we imagine, he imagines them grabbing their equipment and rushing away from the fire and, you know, fetching their negatives and wheeling them away. And uh, no, one was, no one was killed in the fire but a hell of a lot of rats. But here we have, and here we have a crowd looking down First Avenue, 
and here's Fry Opera House. All every building in, in, in this photo disappeared and under the flame into the flames. But all these people survived, and it uh, it provided a, 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 a an opportunity to rebuild a city in brick and stone. But there are only maybe half a dozen photos of the fire itself because of there's not very many, and so this is one of the one of the more evocative ones. There are I'd say a dozen would be closer to it. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of photos post fire. Oh yeah, where beautiful ruined ruins. shots. Yeah. Now but, this, I have a question, and that is why is that we can never, it seems, muster any sympathy for rats. <laughs> why is that? These are living creatures. They have families. They too need to eat and run and play. Think about the rats for a while, okay? Right. I, I have a theory about that. I think it's because they're very, very close in all of their social structures to human beings. And I think that we, we envy them and detest them in equal measure. Well, that's interesting, yeah. Gene. Huh. At least I do. Yeah, well, I know you, you detested them, and I, that's why I brought it up. And I'll give you an opportunity to confess. Well, let me use my 21-foot pole once again at first in spring. And we're looking down at now the brick and the stone and the concrete. And we'll jump right now to a portrait of the hideous ruins. Within a couple days after the fire, they, they took this photo. And you can see the, 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 the firefighters gathered down below with a handful of officials. I think that's Snidely Whiplash. Well, he comes in the show later. He on. does here, he comes in later as well, but he has the same stance, you know. Yeah, I just so. noticed that. So here we are in a very familiar a location which you will all be familiar with, and pay attention to the front of this, what is a flat iron uh, building, the ruins of the front of the flat iron building, and we will see it again in our next slide because we're looking right along the Pioneer Building, which was built after the fire, but here is the leading edge. What do you call that one there that Gene's pointing at? What is this structure? Speak up. Sinking ship parking garage. Sinking, sinking ship parking garage. Yeah. Well, there's the sinking ship garage. Let's go back. And you, the, the front of this, which is actually the Occidental Hotel, burned down in the fire, the front of it is what eventually was replaced by the sinking ship garage. Now, we'll go quickly to Pioneer Square. Uh, this is 1908, and you can see that 20 years after the fire, we have this magnificent building built on top of the triangle uh, that was the Occidental Hotel, the Seattle Hotel. And it was quite uh, spectacular. And it has the same shape. I don't. I think it was about the same height, Paul. Um, the, as the accident, maybe a floor uh, smaller. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. I, I would say a floor shorter. But you can look at it today, and if you can look below the Smith Tower, you'll it see they may be the same height. I don't know. The, I don't know. It was the, the, the one, the Occidental was finished off in 87, and it only was there for a couple of years, when then it was burned down by the fire. Well, today we look at, you can see the sinking ship, and you can see why it's called the sinking ship, because it, it does have that odd yeah. sort of... But what's, I, I think what's, um, What's, so let's go back and take another look at it because it's going to lead us somewhere else. You keep going back to this thing. It's 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 it's, it's painful. <laughs> the sinking ship is painful, Gene. It is. But you you have a comment about the the delicacy and the uh, the sensitivity, and the sensitivity of the. the well, now you see the building behind it, across Yesler Way there. See that building and the basket handle windows on the top. A nice uh, post-fire structure, still there. It's where the Merchant Cafe is. So the sinking ship garage was very offensive to locals, especially the preservationists, who said, 
what are you doing tearing down this beautiful old hotel and giving us this piece of uh, concrete junk? And they said, wait a second, we hear you, we're going to respond and be sympathetic. We're going to give you a parking garage that includes some of the, the points of, uh, architectural points of sympathy that the hotel has. And so what did they do? They put the basket handle uh, on top. You see the vent? Yeah, right there, see. So that was their answer for that. And they're still there. They're still there. I think it shows, you know, a combination of extraordinary vulgarity and sensitivity. And sensitivity, yeah. Right. All right, thank you very much. Well, as Paul mentioned, it, the, the preservations came out and uh, in, in force and were very unhappy about the loss of Seattle Hotel. Amongst them was Victor Steinbrook, who uh, ended up leading the movement to save the Pike Place Market because it was it was the 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 next great structure under threat uh, that offended the entire city, and and so everyone came out, and it was it was Victor who led the charge, and thought we have. I think we featured the march in front of Seattle Hall in the column with Victor with the signs, save the market. And uh, the, uh, but, of course, let's take a look at what he saved. Well, this is 1907. We're looking up the market as, you know, as it's, as it's just begun. And today, there we are. And at the far end, if you've been we walked up to the far end now. Victor Steinbrook Park is uh, is not isolate. It actually has a passageway that runs all the way down the front alongside the disappearing viaduct, all the way down the front towards the senior housing, which you would like to... to I, might, I might be moving into this uh, neighborhood, yeah. To live out my last burden years, yeah. Do you want it grown? Do you want us to? Uh, so listen, could we? I like it. Well, that's a nice thing because I could have everybody here. Would you help me out uh, and grown? Let's do a, a, you know, use your mouth, use it, and let's do some. Uh, Should it be a grown of pity or a support? Yeah, no, just a. Or, oh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very sympathetic. Now we've done thirty shows. We've never done a groan of support. Well, that's a beautiful oh, piece. Don't you? It's very. I think we should have recorded it. Oh, Clay has that. On Clay has got it going, don't you? We'll refer to that. <laughs> oh, Clay, bless you. Well, this is uh, this is an interesting location, and it was featured in the column only maybe two years ago. So, if you've been following, some of you know exactly where this is. Any guesses? Where could this be? I'll give you a clue. It's mid fifties, mid nineteen fifties. Where could this be? An alleyway, which is no longer an alleyway. Well, let's just go straight there for the shock value. So, an Austrian expat came to Seattle and worked for Boeing, and in the mid fifties would wander around the city with his camera, and he took thousands of photos, many of which are in the University of Washington archives. And in More of them at the Seattle Public Library. Seattle Public Library, and all over. And this is uh, one of a couple that he took looking down Melrose Place, which became the freeway. The, the second one featured in the book is looks in the opposite direction, so we can see side by side these these Can photos. you find that in the book and open it up, open the page? I think it would be, we'll do it after the show. No, you won't do it. I know you won't do it. You will. say you will. It's hard to find. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you do it after the show for all these people? Uh, never mind. Okay. We'll have to argue. Here, I'll just one card on my phone. Go ahead, go ahead. While we go forward, you find it. All right, thank you. I've got a mark in Thank you very much. Okay. You are a burden, that's true. You look for it. Okay. <laughs> So, oh, this uh, is a good book, Gene. Really a good book. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, he talks to me. Look at that. Here we are at the corner. As oh, Paul looks for the beautiful the photo. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, so here's the inside yeah. of the Occidental Hotel. See this right here? The one that was torn down for the 
forsaken your house, and then there it is. Okay. It's hard to see. That's why I'm saying, you know, we have a big screen. You can and see that a little bit, can't you? Not much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you need another groan of oprobation. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is a. Uh, uh, it's downtown Third Union, a federal building. Columbia City. Columbia City. <laughs> it's gonna appear in the show. It's 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 showing up in the program. You're just you're you're jumping the gun here. Okay. You know, we could just have the audience come up, gather around, and you could go through the book. In any case, so here we have the, the post office at the corner of Third and Union, and you can see that it has these remarkable sandstone columns and a set of steps going up to it. In fact, the common uh, phrase heard on, in, on Seattle streets in 1908 forward was, meet me on the post office steps. And for 50 years, uh, it was a meeting place, uh, kind of one of those marvelous interim spaces for citizens to, to gather. Well, in 1958, they tore it down and replaced it with a modern building. And the reason they tore it down was because the sandstone was covered with 50 years of, of pigeon poop. Pigeon shit. Pigeon shit, yeah. And evidently, Chucking that sandstone and pigeon shit just don't, they didn't think it mixed, they didn't want to really clean, do a deep clean, so they tore the building down instead and replaced it with today's lovely, modern... So no more meeting at the steps, but it, you know, across the street is the Ben and Royal Hall. A PI architectural critic about 10 years ago said this was the ugliest building in Seattle and he, he thought it looked like a filing cabinet lying on its side. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a story of loss, and I think there was some preservation activity trying to prevent the loss of the post office in 58 as well, but to no avail. The uh, guy who tore it down was very much in favor of not tearing it down. Farrell, Farrelly, I think his name was, he was a sort of a, uh, a protector of of the landmarks, and but his job was to tear them down. So he would argue against the tearing down for several buildings, and then finally he was paid to do it because he was the best in the city. Mm -hmm. But he pointed out he thought it was really stupid to do it. Well, there's some kind of conflict there, but I don't get it. Yeah. Well, that's a that, that's sort of a yeah. That's kind of one of those personal. Yeah, you know, you'd, you'd probably go to your grave thinking of all the desecration that you caused, even yeah. if you were reluctant. Well, he got paid. Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah. Well, let's go forward to oh, mid-30s. We're down in the Seattle docks, and you can see Smith Tower up here. We're looking up uh, to the north. This is about 250 of the 500 buildings, 500 structures in Uberville. And I went back today, and they kindly, Port of Seattle, gave me a lift to get up to replace the perch of the original photographer, which was probably the B.F. Goodrich building, which no longer exists. So they let me get up on a lift, and we're looking back, and you can see Smith Tower again. And just the portion of the viaduct, which I think is gone, that is no longer there. Gene, do you remember what I was looking for? <laughs> you, you just passed it. You were looking for the <laughs> Langenhager oh, okay. shots. Thank you. Well, this is one of the last trolleys in the north end of Seattle. And as we got rid of trolleys... Uh, Gene, these are both by Langen. I know they are. These are the shots you took. So they are, it's true. Why don't we show them so they can see how they're arranged? Yeah, you, you hold it up. Okay, there we go. I want you to think about how proud your friends in, in the Midwest will be that you sent them this book. See that? Okay. Clay, can you see it? Yes, I can. Oh, he knows it backwards and forwards anyway. Clay was the editor of the book. So I don't want you to ask him what he thinks of the text. Please, just look us that. Okay. So we've jumped out of Fremont. You want to find that in the book, Paul? Oh, that's a nice one. Okay. Yeah. So at, this is the corner of 
uh, Fremont Avenue and the intersection of 34th Street, and it was recorded on April 2nd, 1940. And again, it's one of the last trolleys. There are no trolleys left running downtown, no, track, no uh, trolleys on tracks. Uh, they've all been disappeared and, and replaced with uh, oil and trackless trolleys. And here, in fact, that's the Finney Ridge, so it goes from Fremont up to Finney. The motorman took this photo of uh, or one of the motormen uh, who, who ran the trolleys, and it was uh, within a year the last trolleys in Seattle had disappeared to be replaced by today's, or the 40s version of today's buses. To, what I had to do here was find a significant event at 34th and Fremont that would replace the trolleys. Look at okay, it. keep looking. Well, okay. there. Oh, that's nice. So, Gene, they're all nice. Every picture you did in this book is beautiful, <laughs> and you are to be complimented. Let's well, give them a big applause. No, don't. You please. don't even know. Please you don't. haven't seen it. Don't don't it. it. Fantastic. Clay, you're not uh, applauding. <laughs> so here we are at the corner of Fremont in 2017 for the Summer Solstice Festival, the Fremont Parade. And uh, in place of the trolley, we, we have a couple women walking abreast. <laughs> I don't have to show them that, they got it right there. Here, take this away. It just All right. bothers me. I don't want to okay, don't look at it anymore. Okay. Uh, this is the Go Hain Festival in 1921, and a Webster and Stevens portrait of the celebration in Chinatown on King Street. And I, uh, much has remained the same in, in the International District today. Here's down this street is, is the Wing Luke Museum. And these buildings, the Hotel Milwaukee, is still the Hotel Milwaukee. And so I had to repeat it with, with uh, I certainly had to get lion dancers in this in the current photo. So because you can see the the celebration with lion dancing, and I think this was a chess club with lion dancers, and it lasted for several days. I went back to Chinatown and found in the Seattle Kung Fu Club. Uh, all the participants came out on the street, led by John Leon, who's been running the club. He's also 80, Paul. And he's, he's 88, isn't he? No, he's 80. He's just 80. Well, he but he so still teaches. He's so much younger than I am. And these are his he's in shape and too. students. Yeah, he's in, he's in marvelous shape. Yeah. He came down and we took over King Street, and this is a West Seattle cop who said, no problem, just take your time. Hey, that's nice. Okay. And there we are in Columbia City. And I, I really like the story you tell in the book about, because it's a story of not only the creation of, of what was annexed by Seattle in 1907, I think, uh, but the story right, of... 1907, is it, for Columbia City? Yes. Okay, right on. But it's the story of, of one of your, an entrepreneur and an early resident and it's James Kipp in Edmiston, who uh, who sold lots and, and essentially was wasn't he responsible for, for, for the, the creation of this of this area right here? Well, he was important to it, but he wasn't solely responsible. There were many people that had to cooperate with him and go along and and invest in the trolley and uh, build homes on their own accounts. But he owned his own little railway. He owned a well a did, bank in Walla Walla. Did, and in '93, but he was a yes, he was a capitalist. You know. He was a capitalist, but in '93, uh, he he went bankrupt, and his bank failed in the depression of '93, and uh, all his investors lost everything, and he was convicted of extortion. Not extortion. What do you call it in the in uh, uh, you know, something that the same thing so that they tried to get uh, embezzlement president for, but it didn't work. <laughs> No, he was convicted of... It may still work, though. He was convicted of embezzlement. And, but over the next 15 years, he paid back every single investor in his, in his bank and business. So they all got paid back. And by 1911, he was pardoned by the, the, the governor. I think, I think we should give him a hand. Right? I don't think you're right. We'll give him a hand, both posthumously. You guys aren't impressed, are you? With that? <laughs> I think that's I think that's pretty oh, impressive. That's beautiful, yeah. What cross street is that? 
Oh, this work, let's take a look. You'll see it today. Recognize it? <laughs> now, for those, uh, for the historians here, there's one building that remains from the original photo. Let's take a look. Can you tell me, it actually lost a story, but the building, I believe, is still in situ. Let's take a look. Which one is it, G? I, I think in your original column you mentioned this as the building is, you've got in the old, in the old uh, uh, photo you've got um, Fraternity Hall on the left and the Hepler Grocery uh, in the middle. And then next to that is, uh, on the right, is the uh, Knights of Pythias Hall. And the Pythias Hall today is not in this photo, is it too far down? Well, you're looking you actually, you've got it flipped. Oh, that's the other side of the street. You just took the wrong side of the street. <laughs> so this is the Pythias Hall right here? No. No, 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 no. you're now here. The now, you're, you think that this now is the wrong side of the street? No, yeah. it's not the wrong side. That's on the east. That's the east. We're looking across that's to the east side. The old photo, the, L, the then photo, I don't think so. So the historical society is the is the Hepler right there now, and Soriano's plumbing. You're looking you're looking west, and you, you took a picture on the east side. Here's an interesting case. Now, in Paul's original column, which we retook, he had your a local historian who was your Columbia City authority standing in this photo to retake it. And, uh, and there's the school back there, which is to the west of this right. intersection. That's right. Right. Okay, let's go back to the now then. And you're facing east. That's the east. That's the hotel. Is that Paul in the photo? No, no. This is this is a fellow named David Furcade. Wow. Did you think that was Paul Heald? No, I thought it might be you. Uh -huh. no. All right, let's let's clear this one out. Where would the... <laughs> you think they're through just figuring this out now? The now picture is late, right? What's that? The now picture is Maybe the then picture is in <laughs> How could it be that my authority, the guy who knew this history of this community better than anybody, who directed me to take you this picture this way, and who used, among other things, the... What's that? What you know. He was probably over <laughs> You guys got to talk louder. I can't hear you. What was your point? I was trying to make it funny. I said he was probably over 80 years old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He was ancient in days. Well, let's. This is actually one of the one of the uh, original columns is on. This column is on the website. Is on paulorpat.com. Yeah. Aren't those shadows <coughs> from the tree and the pole showing that north is to the right? Speak up. Will you? The shadows showing that north is to the right. Well, uh, it depends on the time of year. Or day. Um, so what is your point about the shadows? I'm getting. Okay. He's talking about moss growing. What's that? <laughs> moss growing on the tree. <laughs> We've got buildings here that should tell us fairly quickly what where we're at, and that's what. Uh, huh? That is the school. Where's the school? That's the school for sure. Yeah. So that that puts it to the west. Yes. Okay. So that's the west side. Right. Right. Okay. And you're saying when we go back to the contemporary photo, that's the east side. Right. The school's on the other side of the street. Thank God you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this picture is taken. Kitty corner. Right? Yeah, that's 
now it's fascinating because they do that. It's it's interesting because the the original historian that was Paul's first interlocutor about Columbia City, this is where the where he directed Paul to take the photo. Well, I, I wouldn't say that he could possibly be mistaken. So I think it must have been my mistake that I didn't interpret him correctly. But he's standing in the photo, so he must have not yeah, understood. That's true too. He was kind of old then. That's true. But my, <laughs> my age right now. And another thing, I had done another story on that building later on. So why wouldn't I catch it later on when I did another story on that building? I don't know. I apologize. <laughs> if we ever reprint this thing, let's see. <laughs> Well, it's 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 like the Leonard Cohen song. How does that go? Backwards. Does anybody have a clue what Leonard Cohen song he's talking about? No. It's the, 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 through the crack that the light comes in. Yeah. So there's got to be at least one flaw, one mistake. Now that's the. Uh... And this picture here. What's that? I'm going to say that the building, if that's the Columbia Hotel. Yeah. On the southeast corner of Ferdinand and Rainier. Yeah. And then on the left, the little building was a drugstore at one time. Uh, on the far left? Yeah, yeah, that, that one, one story building. That was a drugstore. Yeah. So, so where are you leading us? So we're looking <laughs> east. Yeah, we, well, we, we, yeah, we're definitely looking east. Yeah, that's okay, true. and there's no school to the east of here. The school is behind us to the west. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yes. why the photos are opposite. Well, from, from the side of the uh, Rainier that I thought I was standing on with Carrie was on the, we were standing on the west side, on the side where his home was. And, uh, <coughs> Oh, look at the people are fleeing. Look at that. Disgusting. Let's move on. Let's go forward. See if we can find any more mistakes. <laughs> so again, we'll tear the page out for you. Just come up here and find it. <laughs> go ahead. So here we have a, a 1906 trip down from Lake Washington. And these, uh, these picnickers, canoers, were headed for salt water. And at this point, they're on the Black River. And today, if we return to that spot, we find no Black River, but Rainier Avenue South. And this is, this is pretty close to the place where they pulled over, is, we estimate. Are and we're sure we got this right. <laughs> Scott of the Brown Bear Car Wash remembered the great grandfather. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll have to, uh, well, here's this is a a particularly deceptive photo because it's a it's it's a little bay, it's of a little bay in Lake Union, and uh, it's it's a it's a kind of a pool that extends. It sort of bulges out, and you can see along here, along this side on Lake Union, there's Capitol Hill, and along this side, that's Westlake. Not Eastlake, but Westlake. So are we looking west or east? <laughs> I think we're looking east. We're right? looking east, that's right. Now, um, this collection I got from a guy who had found it in a suburb up over on the, on the coast. And uh, he heard me interviewed on the radio and called me up while I was there on the radio and told me about the collection and then later on. And, but it's a beautiful collection of glass negatives of uh, the Brown family. And, and we see the kids? Oh, there's the Brown kids, yeah. So that, what hill is that in the distance? Oh, I already... I already mentioned it. Did you mention it? Yeah, no, you said a hill. No, I said Capitol. Yeah, okay. Said All right, I think we're going to lose this crowd pretty soon. We've got to move on. I think we're getting edgy. Let's speed it up, okay? So I went, I went back to this very spot, and you can see it has changed a bit. And I took my neighbor children back with me, Leah and T. 
Tia, Tia Liana and Tia Owen, who live across the street. And this was for the Mohai show in 2011. And today, we went back just last year, and Leah is 16 and going to Roosevelt, and she can drive, which is terrifying. <laughs> Well, there we are with the Kalakala. And it's coming back through the, the locks, headed back out to the sound. It's uh, uh, 1948. You can see the upper decks are jam-packed with celebrants and all the little circular port windows. And at the very top, pay close attention to the wheelhouse with its little, with its restricted view windows up at the top. But it's coming through the locks being tugged along, and I had to return and find something that was roughly equivalent. And so in early 2017, I went back. I'd heard that a destroyer was being refurbished in Lake Union. Did you hear that in the bars of <laughs> I heard it at the locks. I said, is there anything coming through in the next month or two that might match this shot? So this is, as it turns out, this is the USS Turner Joy. And the Turner Joy was one of the, the two naval vessels involved in the Gulf of Tonkin. It came to the assistance of the USS Maddox. So uh, it, it now is a museum ship out at Bremerton. And this was coming through, through the locks. And so here is the Turner Joy off the coast of Vietnam. And most of you, I'm assuming, know the story of the Gulf of Tonkin. One of, the, one of the resolutions that actually got us into the Vietnam War full-fledged. Uh, with a lie. With a bit of a lie. Guys, you're really long. You're really holding up well. Now, we're going to come to a presentation here that involves our editor. That's true. So here we are. Over here with the, with the camera. Over here, sitting over here with the camera. The Kalakala, and we actually, were, let me just Clay say, took this photo. We were, remember we had you doing sound effects earlier? That was a warm up for now, okay? Okay. Come on up, Clay. So Clay went back and he took a picture of the wheelhouse of the Kalakala, which still exists. Very, there's only a shard of it that remains. But the wheelhouse is out in front of Salty's in West Seattle. Clay? Well, how many of you rode the Kalakala? I'm sure there's a great number, yeah. The Kalakala, it was a sensory experience, and I was able to ride the Kalakala the last month of its run on, from Seattle to Bremerton. And uh, what Paul is talking about is the sound that I remember, and maybe some of you do too, because it was cavernous and spiderwebby and noisy, and when the engine took on, it's, it's noise to pull out of Seattle. All I could hear was wah, 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 wah. And the, the sides of the ferry were vibrating and it was on its last legs. There's the sound effect. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. take the thing back. Now we would like to have a chorus here. Talk a lot of fun of it. Are you ready on four? Ready? Come on, pick it up. One, come on, you lead them. All you have to do is imitate a vibration. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Very good, very good. We have some real musicians in this audience. That's fun. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clay. There's the blog we're looking from West Seattle back to the city. And it's this. One of the problems with the, with the vessel itself was this wheelhouse, because it was an obstructed view. So there always had to be a communication between a deckhand and someone up top waving and signaling to let the, the pilot know yeah. to slow down. Do you know what the fee dollar sign amulet stand for? I don't. Clay, do you have any idea? No clue. Yeah. Well, here's a, show, here's a shot taken just before the viaduct opened. April 1953, in a couple of days before they, it opened to cars. And we have the Smith Tower and two women in red. And today, 
the Smith Tower in a red car. <laughs> and up here, we're just, we'll come back to this in just a few, just a minute, this particular structure, which is called the Mark, or now the F5 building. So this is a view that's, that has disappeared. We can't get there from here. And that's a recent destruction. This is from about. It's closed off. They haven't destroyed this yet, have they? I believe they have. I think this is gone. Yep. Well, how many of you here are sad that they uh, we lost the viaduct and and opened up the waterfront? How many of you are sad about that? One, two, three, four, five, six, dozens, dozens. Yeah. If I'd addressed that question differently, I'm sure I could have got a different vote. But I sympathize with the with the people that want the viaduct, and so you took that as an ascent. And I'll tell you, one of the real leaders of your group, and it hurts us to say this, but he's going to be hurt for a long time, that again is Clay Eels, who is uh, the editor of the West Seattle newspaper for a long, long time, and is the head of the historical group over there, which I think you learned earlier. Clay was a real champion for the viaduct. We argued all the time about it. And hence, uh, Gene actually had to hold back his own feelings about it because he didn't want to alienate either Clay or I. So, go ahead, Gene. Okay. So here we are looking at the building from behind. This is the, the mark or, or the F5 building. You can see the Methodist dome down below it. And it's a lovely building. Now, where did it come from? And this was just something we discovered in our, in our travels. And it was developer Kevin Daniels, who was working with uh, ZGF Architects. And he asked them, he said he wanted to be trying to articulate the qualities he wanted in a structure. He said that that, that that structure should have qualities of style and sophistication and sexiness. And he showed them this photo and said, this is what I want. And it, in fact, as they were building the structures, they were rising it up in the front lobby. The workmen would go past a large, blown up photograph. And this is the one from uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Audrey Hepburn was his. So look back at that. You can see the cant of her hips and her shoulders and her, her cigarette holder. Well, it's the same thing, Gene, no doubt about it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, beautiful, here's, beautiful. here's another event that's commemorated in the book, and we have, you may, re you may recognize a, a mayor of ours, this is from 89, it was, a, it was actually a, um, an event that Clay was, was involved with, and it was saving, he led it, he led, it. He led this, uh, this uh, one of his many West Seattle, this was closing <coughs> night supposedly, and we, we organized a picket in two days, and we had 50 people come out, and it was perfect that the last movie on the marquee was Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. <laughs> Six months from then, after a lot of hard work, we got the mo movie theater landmarked, and that's why it's here today. So you have Greg Nichols, uh, who was a councilman then, and you have his wife Sharon, and Georgette Batley, is, uh -huh. is she there? On the right. On the right, yeah. And they came out, and many years later, in fact, five years ago now? It's uh, uh, almost four years ago, 2016. When Clay was head of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, he would arrange what he called group hugs, and to celebrate the, 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 uh, the Admiral Theater, he, he got me up on another lift truck, and we shot this is opening night in 42, and then... And here we are, four years ago. We have kids from Lafayette, Schmitz Park, and Alki Elementary, all of whom walked to this, and it really does look like a hug of the building. They had to sit on each other's laps in the theater, actually. There wasn't enough seats there. And we had Greg Nichols back and Norm Rice back to speak to this group. Wonderful. Well, we're, we're coming into the end here. This is the oldest structure extant 
in Seattle. And it was, a, a, it was given to Paul, or loaned to Paul, uh, years and years ago. And this is a, a, a structure that was built to replace, and it was built by Doc Maynard to replace a house in West Seattle that burned down in 58 when he moved out to West Seattle with his wife Catherine. And so he built this house in, sometime in the, in, the, in the early 60s. And it was sold to a family of some distinction, the Hanson family. And as it turns out, this gal and young woman on the, on the porch here in the white dress was the mother of who? Paul? Ivor Hagman. Where's my hat? Here. This is right, right. Here's the clues for that. <laughs> so he, she has her family all around her. There's her, her mother on the porch. There's her dad. There's Snidely Whiplash again. <laughs> there, and uh, one of the young children peeing on the corner. <laughs> but, um, so May Maynard built this house, sold, and it was sold to the Hanson family, and this picture is probably from the 90s, and we look at it today, and it's, it's unmarked, there's a little plaque at the end of the street, but it doesn't give the address, if you want to know the address, look in the book, and here it is you today. It's the same spot. Now, the only thing that's, the, the, the main thing that's changed is they've taken down this, this little wing, which one of the descendants, and a Hanson actually came to one of the shows and says, you know, I think that wing was taken, was added to Maynard's original structure by the Hansons. So we don't have evidence of that or not, but this may well be um, uh, closer to its original form. In any case, it is the oldest structure in Seattle, this, this wood, wood house, which has been renovated since I took the photo. Uh, it, it, it's, they've cut back the bushes and put a nice little porch on front. It's, it's kind of lovely. Oh boy. Catherine Maynard was, uh, and Doc Maynard were, were, were both good friends of, of Chief Seattle, and Catherine particularly of his daughter, Kiki Soglu, or as Catherine uh, monikered her, Princess Angeline. And about a year and a half ago, uh, one of our collaborators, Ron Edge, figured out where Princess Angeline's house was below Western and the Pike Place Market. And he used this stump and the eaves uh, around and, and, and actually triangulated to, to find this spot, which, is, which was not actually, we, we didn't know. We, we had no idea where she was, except that there was kind of a rough radius of, we knew she was below Western. And I went back with Ron, and to our delight, Ron is sitting on what was her porch. It's between the Pike Place Market garage and the Fix Mador building on the right there. And the, the marvel of it is, it's, it's this little green space, maybe 20, 25 feet wide, that runs all the way up to Western. And if you're sitting, as Clay will tell you, if you're sitting in, in the restaurant. Lowell's. In Lowell's. You know where down. Lowell's is in the market? Yeah. yeah. Next time you go there, eat upstairs on the second floor, Look out the window, straight down below you is this site here, this little wooded site. Mm -hmm. That's Princess Angeline's home site. What should they order? Uh, the seafood. Okay. <laughs> seafood. He loves those puns. Well, this is also reflective of one of those hills. If you if you looked at David Williams, too high and too steep. This is a, a wonderful example, and, and a rare example in this spot, of the, the hillside as it ran up from the waterfront to what is now below the market, what is western. And so this, this steep structure was, seemed pretty daunting to those early settlers who showed up and, and, and looked from the sand spit below and, and wondered, how am I going to get up there? So. Well, that's it. No, yeah. One more, Paul. 
Well, here we go with Prince, the princess and her dad. Uh, inset photo of, of Chief Seattle and Kiki Soto is sitting in what is now Post Alley, right? As it merges onto First Avenue alongside Pike. And we went back and we brought along a couple of visitors to retake this photo. And here is Princess Angeline's great 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 granddaughter, Mary Lou Slaughter, who is uh, also 80 years old. She is. No? No? And here is Ken Workman, who is the great 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 grandson of Chief Seattle through his second wife. So they came out, Mary Lou is, is one of the uh, most accomplished and, and uh, talented basket weavers and, and cedar workers uh, in, in the region. And in fact, if you go to the Duwamish Longhouse, look on the floor and you'll see that the, the whole structure of the parquet floor is, is modeled after one of her baskets. So it's, a, it's all, it's this remarkable, gorgeous par parquetry, par marquetry, what, what's the name for it? Anyway, that's all from Mary Lou's basket. Now we were taking this photo and Clay stood behind me and we spent maybe 10, 15 minutes in the market and we took uh, a number of pictures of them in that spot. And Clay snapped this photo and, and Ken, as we were taking the, the photos, kept urging us to, to, to hurry up. And afterwards, we were sitting and uh, having a, a snack and eyebrows down on the waterfront. And, and I, I said, well, Ken, why were you so eager for us to get this, get this done with? And he said, well, we were sitting, we were standing and sitting and you had us moving up and down. And, and about halfway through, someone was tapping me on the elbow. And Clay and I looked at him and, and and we said, well, there was no one behind you tapping on the elbow. No one was trying to get past. He says, well, I was sure that I was in someone's way. And, uh, and so his interpretation was that there was, a, there was another presence there, an ancestral presence, <laughs> telling him to get out of the way. <laughs> Vibra vibration. And to conclude, I'd just like to say this is something that... Uh, that when I retake these modern photos, if I'm successful, I feel that little dropping into place of, of an, an older vision. And there's a, there's a, little, a, a little nudge from history. And uh, yeah, that's it. It's, it's a nudge, it's not a thud. And it's just too heavy. That's much better. Anyway, so that's it. Thank you very much for coming to the show. Well, as you know, they do have books here for a signature, and if you would like to purchase one, you're going to be coming up here, and there's side, there's um, stairs over here. I did want to mention one thing about that photograph in Columbia City. Uh, we have hot off the press our historic walking tour map that's out at that table, and it has that photo in front. So Box Meets is one of that. It's the, it's the one only um, lasting uh, building there. So you'll notice Geraldine's is on the other side. So I'm sure that these two will be correcting the book at some point. <laughs> Yeah. So feel free to do the walking tour map. There's 26 sites that we put on it, and it's uh, really fun to take. It's, it's like two or three blocks worth of a walk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure.